Thank you. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about weird but binary behavior, you know, what to look for. Uh, and I am Rachel Schwock. I am a detection engineer at Red Canary. So I make detectors and hunt for evil across a very wide variety of environments. Uh, I got my start working as an analyst on a cyber incident response team. And I got to admin a wide variety of security tools and wear a lot of hats. And in my free time, I enjoy reading, puzzles, Legos, and good food. So what are lull bins? Uh, so it stands for living off the land binaries. Uh, these are binaries that are either downloaded from Microsoft or they're already native in the operating system. Uh, usually they're already native in the operating system. Um, so today, on those binaries, like, you know, if you're still confused, think of like Notepad or Excel. Uh, those are like Microsoft binaries that you can find. Um, today I'll be talking more about default binaries that can be used to download or execute malicious code. Um, so like usually like PowerShell and the scripting engines get a lot of love. I'm going to talk a bit about Run DLL 32, Reg Server 32, MS Build, MSI Exec, MSHTA, kind of the ones that are maybe the underdogs uh, when comparing it to like PowerShell. And if you're wondering how often this is seen in threats, quite a bit. Um, in 2022 alone, over a third of Red Canary malicious and suspicious detections had lull bins in them. And those weren't ones that were testing. So that's like excluding all the testing uh, and the adversary emulation stuff. Those were real threats that contained lull bins. So how do you even get started? Well, you're gonna have to learn about the binary first. Um, you're gonna wanna learn, you know, what is this binary supposed to be doing normally? So that way you even know what to expect if it is behaving in a strange manner. Uh, so some good sources that are free. I really like Echo Trail because it gives a summary of what is it, um, what is like its normal path that it should be executing from, what are you know common networking ports that this binary uh, makes connections on, uh, what is the normal lineage, really good information to just get a baseline on what is normal for execution. Uh, and Lulbass and the Strontic Encyclopedia, the Ex Encyclopedia for Executables, uh, those both give really good examples of normal and detection logic on like what is kind of weird. So it'll give you like, oh, you know, if it's proxying execution, this is what that looks like. And here's like some good detection logic ideas for that. Uh, Atomic Red Team is also great for showing how the binary can be abused, uh, how you can actually test in your own environment for that method of abuse and see if you're actually, you know, seeing what you expect to when you build out your logic. And then also a shout out for the Red Canary Threat Detection Report because it'll list the binaries and also show like what malware families that we see using these binaries. There are plenty of other ones out there, but just kind of getting started, those are good resources. So now we have our sources. We're going to try to gather what is normal. So kind of keep in mind when you're looking at through this information on what does this binary do? Uh, what is the normal process path? Should this binary be making network connections? If it does, should it be making external network connections? Should it be you know, only maybe reaching out to Microsoft if it's an external connection? Uh, and what are the typical command line parameters? Uh, keep in mind if it always executes with the command line, that's something to look for or if it never has command line parameters. And if you by chance get a consistent parent or child lineage, that's also pretty helpful. Uh, there's a couple out there like SVC hosts will typically execute by services and so that can also help for some detection ideas. And after you kind of baseline normal, 
you're going to look for how can this binary be abused. Uh, so you're going to identify abnormal activity and then look at kind of what malware families are doing to abuse that binary. So some examples that I put here, not relating to any specific binary yet. Um, so like downloading things from a remote resource is pretty abnormal. Executing with an unexpected command line or maybe no command line at all. Uh, proxying execution through another process. Uh, executing maybe from like a really random folder instead of system 32. And misuse of a legitimate function. Uh, so that'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But, and then you can look at, okay, I'm going to look at specific threat families uh, and see what they're doing. And maybe they're injecting into the process and spawning reconnaissance commands. Uh, or maybe the system binary is being executed by a Microsoft Office binary. And renamed and relocated system utilities. Um, this one can really help if you get that metadata of a binary, so that way you can see, you know, if CMD is renamed uh, to utilman, that's something you could pick up just based on that internal naming scheme of the binary. All right, so now I'm going to walk through an example. Uh, I like run DLL32. It's used a lot by various different threats. Uh, so what is run DLL32 in the first place? So it enables the execution of dynamic link libraries. So basically little code functions that different processes can call. Uh, and it typically executes out of system 32 or syswile 64 if it's a 32-bit system. Uh, and according to Echo Trail, its most common parents are SVC host, explorer, run DLL32, and spools v. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list though. Run DLL32 can have quite a few different parents normally. Uh, its most common children are going to be run DLL32, WinSAT, and DF service, but also not an exhaustive list there. It has been observed making network connections, but typically only on 443 and 80, and usually it's going to be to common network connections or internal network connections and not so much strange, you know, newly created domains. Uh, and it also executes with the command line. So it's not one of those that executes without one. It typically will look like run DLL32 with the DLL name and DLL function. So it should execute with those parameters under normal circumstances. All right. So looking at some examples of how run DLL32 can be abused, uh, so it can abuse legitimate DLLs or export functions to perform malicious actions. Uh, in this case, it is calling the comm services DLL and calling the mini dump function to dump LSAS. Uh, and LSAS has a lot of juicy secrets. It's got you know all the credentials on that local host. Uh, and so that can be abused uh, to get credentials. It can execute malicious adversary supplied DLLs and it can also use other legitimate functions uh, to bypass application control solutions. Uh, in this one, it is calling the DLL register server function, which normally is used legitimately by reg server 32 because that's the binary responsible for registering DLLs. And so when run DLL 32, which is supposed to execute DLLs, uses that function, that's something to keep an eye on because it's, it's a pretty rare thing for it to legitimately do. Uh, and in this case, it's calling, you know, a text file in the user's public folder. Uh, and so definitely suspect there with the folder containing a definitely not text file. So other abnormalities would be run DLL32 executing JavaScript and PowerShell. So this would be proxying execution through those processes and initiating a download from a remote source. And this example here, uh, it's calling JavaScript to then call PowerShell to then download something from a random IP port combination. So a little bit strange for run DLL to do that. Uh, and then executing a DLL in an alternate data stream 
uh, is another method that could be abused. Uh, you got this text file that has a DLL referenced inside of it and then calling the DLL main function to execute it. So it looks, you know, on the surface like it might just be a text file, but it's not. And then you've also got the executing without command line parameters. Like I said, it should always have the DLL name and DLL function. So when it doesn't, that could be a sign that something's up. Now what malware utilizes run DLL32? A lot of them, but here are a couple to get us started. So Qbot, you guys might have heard Qbot was taken down recently, but that Qbot had been around for a really long time and so it's still really worth learning its behaviors um, and its delivery affiliates, TA570 and TA577, they are still around and delivering other things that could behave similarly to Qbot. Uh, and so this is a couple examples of what that DLL execution looked like for Qbot, uh, where it was calling from that public documents folder, a random DLL, um, and calling the RS32 function. Uh, and so that use of a strange folder in a DLL, uh, very strange behavior, and same with the next one, and the program data folder, it's calling a JPEG, which is not a JPEG, uh, and it has just a randomly named uh, function name of wind. So both of those, you know, Qbot would change its delivery method a lot, but it would usually, like, 90% of the time, execute run DLL32 with a weird DLL in a weird folder with weird names. Uh, and the other 10% was like reg server 32. So sock goalish is the next one. And so this is the one that is like, it takes advantage of compromised WordPress sites and leads people to adversary infrastructure to download a browser update. Uh, it tells the user, oh my gosh, you can't continue. Your Chrome is so out of date, please update. And so then they get this, this nice little update.js JavaScript file that then executes run DLL32. And that's what this looks like here. Also using the program data folder and using that function that I mentioned earlier is used by reg server 32 legitimately, the DLL register server function. Gamaroo is another one that is, uh, uses run DLL32, and I like this one because it kind of looks like Morse code going on here with the dash, 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 underscores, but that is the DLL name. Uh, and so it's not redacted or anything, that is just what the DLL naming scheme is, and it's calling that WMSM, whatever, that's the function name. Uh, and so, that's definitely, you know, you see that and you're like, well, something's definitely up there. That's not normal. Uh, and Iced ID is another one that's been around uh, as a banking trojan. It steals financial information and uh, it's also a dropper for other malware. It's been seen dropping ransomware before. Uh, and it will have this DLL and the app data roaming test and then another subfolder. And what I like about this one is it calls a ordinal value function. So that hashtag, the pound sign, whatever you want to call it, uh, that's the ordinal value for saying like the first function basically in that DLL. Uh, and so that's a way that sometimes adversaries will use that to obfuscate what function they're actually calling. All right. So now we'll move on to kind of what telemetry can we use for good detection opportunities? So I like to use command lines. Um, you know, we have the option for the no command line. We have URLs and command lines and those known abuse mechanisms present. So like I mentioned that ordinal value, that's a known abuse mechanism. The DLL register server for run DLL is another one. Uh, the lineage can be a good one. Specifically, if you see something spawning reconnaissance commands, that's usually only going to be done by like 
CMD if like recon's really necessary in your environment. Um, so when you see like run DLL32 or these other binaries spawning it, it's pretty strange. You got process paths, you know, so while well, run DLL32 said that it should be in system 32, so if it's not in there, then it's in like the public documents folder, something to look for. Uh, and the network connections, the file modifications, the module loads, I like to use that usually as a combination of logic uh, instead of like the main supporting logic. So if I do something and maybe like no CLI on its own isn't strong enough and I add no CLI with a network connection, that's usually gonna be uh, less prone to false positives. So here are what I came up with. So for like run DLL32, um, now that we kind of went over what telemetry I usually look at, we'll use that and then say that like process path. So if run DLL executes and it is not in system 32 or syswile 64, that is something I want to look at. If run DLL 32 executes and it spawns JavaScript, uh, that's something I want to look at. If uh, MS Office binary, so if Word spawns run DLL 32, something else to look at. And we got a ton of them with the command line uh, because run DLL 32 does typically use a specific format. So run DLL with no dot DLL in the command line, like we saw those dot JPEGs and dot TXTs that weren't really JPEGs because run DLL 32 shouldn't be executing JPEGs. Uh, so look for that. But you'll also note with the no dot DLL, you'll have to tune a couple things. Uh, it's like dot CPLs and like dot OCXs are sometimes used legitimately. Uh, but start with the dot DLL and as you need to, tune it, don't leave it and let it suffer. Uh, and then run DLL32 without a command line. Uh, so we can look at that and say that it, it might be injected into. Uh, run DLL32 with HTTP in the command line. Uh, it could be trying to download, like we saw earlier with it, proxy execution through JavaScript to then download through PowerShell. So look for HTTP in the CLI and then uh, with the rare function uh, in the command line. So like look for that pound signed or the DLL register server in the command line when run DLL is executing. And apply these ideas to your environment. Cause like I said, this won't always be 100% true positive to your environment right out of the box. So, you know, if you get something and you're like, it's noisy, just tune it out. It should take like two to three tuning sessions because if you let it be noisy, you're not ever going to catch it when it's catching true positive threats. Uh, and if it's, you know, if you can't do it with just a few exclusions, it's probably not worth detecting in your environment because if you see that alert day in and day out, it's just never gonna be value to you. Um, so, you know, try to think of different ways to make that logic better and combine logic to be more specific to certain threats if you need to. So now I'm gonna talk about more threats and what lull bins they use. Raspberry Robin is a fun one. Um, so it usually starts through a infected USB. Um, often they've been used in like printing and mailing centers uh, and Raspberry Robin is usually a dropper of other malware. It's been seen dropping SOC Golish, it's been seen dropping Cobalt Strike and Iced ID. And it likes to use MSI exec. So in this case, you'll see MSI exec executes with this weird camel case lettering and it calls the, with the slash Q for quiet so the user doesn't know anything's downloading and it goes to this website. Um, it's using port 8080, so a little bit abnormal of a port for HTTP traffic. Uh, and it is, so it has like the host name there. It usually will call also with the username. So it will usually be like username slash host name. 
Uh, and if that MSI exec network connection is successful, it will download a randomly named DLL and it'll typically put it in like a subdirectory of program data. Uh, so it also uses run DLL32, reg server 32, and DLL host for follow on C2 activity. And so some detection opportunities for this one would be that MSI exec with a command line of HTTP or HTTPS and the slash Q or the TAC Q. Uh, and then also you could look for a command line that does not contain a dot MSI or a dot MSP because those are the installer files that MSI exec uh, typically will be executing. Iced ID, uh, so we showed it with run DLL 32 earlier, but it also uses MSI exec. Uh, and so like, it was like earlier this year, uh, the Deeper report posted a really good write up on an Iced ID infection that led to widespread domain spread completely like pwned quantum ransomware across the environment in less than 78 hours. So it really moved fast once Iced ID dropped. Uh, and so you wanna catch this one early for sure. Uh, and so this one, it had MSI exec spawning system info, uh, but it'll spawn other reconnaissance commands like NL test uh, slash domain trust or IP config. So look for MSI exec executing and a child process of system info, IP config, net, or NL test. Uh, and some other things that it also used run DLL32, like we mentioned earlier, this was another example of it, uh, calling a dot dat file. So that would be caught with run DLL32 without a dot DLL in the command line. And so this is a fun one that uh, Red Canary has been tracking this fake browser update threat cluster. So Sock Golish is like the OG one that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and recently there's been these other ones come in though, like uh, Scarlet Goldfinch uh, and this fake SG. Uh, fake SG, there's been a write up, I think Malwarebytes has done the best one uh, on kind of in depth on what that does to differentiate it from Sock Golish. But basically these first two, they use wscript.js files uh, to redirect people to these browser updates and it downloads like browser update and then a version number.js or just update.js usually for Sock Golish now. And fake SG, it uses MSHTA with .hta files and it has names like a version number .hta or launcher update .hta. And that's the one I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. So fake SG is really, <laughs> it's kind of interesting in the fact that it uses four files, uh, which is a different lull bin that you can run a command on a file or pass arguments to multiple files using that. And so four files spawned PowerShell. And PowerShell then spawned MSHTA using those wild cards, like it's kind of hard to see there, but it's at Windows System 32 MSHTA with the little wildcard symbols. Uh, and it is calling this compromised WordPress site uh, to download this HTA and that'll execute. So there is a lot of opportunities with this fake SG strain. Uh, the use of four files, uh, spawning PowerShell, that's a good detection opportunity there. And then MSHTA with the command line containing HTTP uh, is also a great opportunity to look for MSHTA downloading anything is usually pretty strange. Uh, and then MSHTA with a parent of PowerShell is another good detection opportunity for this threat cluster. Emotet is one that's been around a while, but I haven't seen it a whole lot this year. Mostly kind of tapered off at the end of 2022, but uh, it liked to, you know, disseminate through emails, attachments, links. Uh, it likes to use macro files for Excel, Word. Uh, in this case, it was Word that then spawned reg server 32 
uh, and reg server 32 then also spawned reg server 32 to execute a DLL. Uh, and additional activity that isn't shown uh, was that reg server made outbound network connections and spawned system info and IP config. Uh, so some detection opportunities for this type of threat would be the MS Office binary spawning reg server 32, reg server 32 with the command line containing app data and not containing that dot DLL is another good one. Uh, at reg server 32 with external network connections, excluding connections to very common external like Microsoft domains. And reg server 32 with a child proc of system info and IP config. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about testing because like these are real threats, but like what do you normally see when people are testing? Is it the same? Is it different? And what do red teams usually do? You know, is it, does it hold up? So this is a graph I pulled from the threat detection report and one that I really enjoy. It's kind of fuzzy up here, but it does point out that a lot of these lull bins are tested just as much in real world threats uh, as they are in just like test environments. So like MSHTA is a little fuzzy up there in Red Server 32, but Red Server 32 is actually used more in real threats than testing. Uh, and that last one is credential dumping. So credential dumping is used way more in testing uh, than it was in our real threats that we saw. Uh, and Windows Command Shell, pretty even. PowerShell is pretty even. Uh, so a lot of them were pretty even, but that credential dumping was the one that was like, dang, that is tested a lot more than it is actually done. And like I said, red teams love lull bins, you know? Why, why get all these external binaries on the system when you can just run it and they're less likely to see it? So they like, and from my experience, I've seen a lot of them do process injection. Uh, so like look for a binary executing with no CLI and an external network connection. Uh, look for connections to uh, content delivery networks like CloudFront or Fastly. That's used a lot. Uh, dumping LSAS through run DLL32 with that mini dump function. Or if you open task manager and you find LSAS, you right click and you hit dump. It'll, it'll, you have the LSAS dump memory right there. So really easy to do. Uh, and then uh, scheduled task, registry run keys, service execution. These can be used for persistence, obviously, but also privilege escalation because services will execute under system. And you can do the same with scheduled tasks. Uh, process and domain account discovery. So look for, you know, uh, trying to look for the domain admins group with the net binary uh, and local admins uh, running who am I. Uh, that's usually, you know, not enough on its own, but if it's rarely done in your environment, maybe you can get away with looking for it. And suspicious directory execution. Uh, so DLL side loading is pretty common. Look for, you know, weird system binaries uh, executing from like a desktop folder or the public folder uh, and look for it loading in a DLL in the same folder because that will usually be the bad DLL. Uh, and so that can be used for UAC bypass or just executing malicious code. Uh, and you should test your systems with, you know, a look for atomic red team and run those tests in your environment because they're safe to do and you'll know if you will catch it uh, when a real threat comes. That's all I've got. So are there any questions? Yeah. So uh, when you're saying that you know, red teams use things like Omai or Anthony, you usually think that the same thing in like internal network penetration testers that actually like adversary simulation or do you kind of hold those uh, I look at that completely different. Those adversary emulation tools, uh, they have a very specific process lineage and they look 
they don't look like somebody hands on keyboard. So we really like to look at those like net commands uh, spawning. Uh, you know, if you're looking for DCs in the domain, we're going to take that a lot more seriously than attack IQ executing. Yeah. Yeah, and so a lot of that, like, with their Cobalt Strike beacons, we'll see a lot of times that process injection piece. And they'll, like, I've seen what's really caught me off guard once was they injected into the open with binary. So we saw open with connecting to, like, cloud front domains. And I'm like, open with doesn't do that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, like, that's, that's good. Like, if you... If they're not using, you know, binaries, you wouldn't think to even monitor. Like, that's a little bit sneakier. Uh, some, uh, like, I don't know. Some red teams are better than others with stealthiness. So, yeah. What's the best way to harden for uh, kind of catching a core if they start misbehaving? So, you know, you can do several things. Don't give everyone local admin access is a good start. Uh, you can try to limit, you know, what files uh, do you allow users to execute. Like, if you change for, like, that sock goalish threat and stuff, the .js, if you change the default to open in notepad instead of, like, wscript, that's a good start because then the user just opens it and they're like, it's not working, you know, instead of, like, you know, they don't see it. They would still be like, oh, it's not working. My browser didn't update, but at least you're not compromised at that point. So uh, just changing what, you know, files you've allowed to execute, maybe what users can execute, yeah, like WScript, PowerShell, maybe not everyone needs to do that. Down to the app, what can the app actually do? You're giving it script forever. Yeah, yeah, and just like, basically, you can do app whitelist day with some stuff, or like, I really just recommend, you know, limiting what users are allowed to execute, like have certain groups that are like, okay, this group is like a power user group and they can do this, but other users cannot. Yeah. So on the slides, you're talking about uh, running uh, Red DLM32, what's called? Yeah. Um, and those are kind of like some images, or like if there's a PNG, right? Are those just like, like hiding or like pretending to be images or actually DLL? So they, <laughs> they are not going to be actual images. I was trying to see which one was it. it yeah, this Qbot one is one. So it, they, they don't try to appear as an image or anything. They just try to appear like if somebody is looking in the program data folder and they see a JPEG, they're like, okay. But if you like open the file properties and you look at like, you know, what is the actual extension, then it'll say like .dll, you know, or like a PE file, basically. I guess I was surprised to see that work, because I know Windows is like really reliant on like the file extension compared to like Linux. Yeah. 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 And then just gibberish sometimes and not make it look like a real file extension, so. Cool. Well, if there's nothing else, thank you guys for listening.